Okay, so um, as NC said that uh, this whole thing of DWATS, I'll first uh, say a little bit about DWATS as in uh, about how this whole thing came about. Actually, DWATS actually stands for just decentralized wastewater treatment systems. Uh, it's actually a registered uh, train name or something right now. So what, uh, as uh, we all know that, uh, I mean, we all started working in the field of sanitation since early 90s. I finished my course in uh, 1990 and since then. And it's sad to say that even now, uh, two and a half decades later, we are still probably struggling with the same basic issues, even though our country might have leaped forward in so many other sectors. It is little sad that even now about 90% or so of our towns and cities don't have any proper uh, waste collection or management system, be it liquid waste or solid waste. And uh, uh, so therefore we all know the related issues of uh, waterborne diseases and uh, all the related things. I don't have to go into details about you. So this whole uh, the step towards trying to go for better sanitation has uh, always been trying to explore what are the possibilities. So over the years, I think there have been several models that have been uh, tried out and uh, demonstrated and pop, uh, kind of multiplied in several parts. Right now, because of the Swachh Bharat uh, mission and all that, there is a much more a stronger uh, thrust on trying to make India totally open, defecation free and all that. Um, the thing is that, okay, to a certain extent, we are able to uh, tackle the, the containment, that is we are able to do the toilets and uh, kind of contain it, taking it one step away from, uh, above from open air defecation. But that actually is creating a whole lot of new challenges. In fact, right now we are uh, working with a village in rural Madhya Pradesh, where actually people were, it's a small village, it's just about uh, 20,000 people or something. And uh, they have been, they have, they have a lot of fields around and all that, and everyone has been used to open air defecation for a long time. But the thing is that now, as part of the Swachh Bharat, they have been given toilets. But the toilets, when they are built, they are not, if you are not giving enough thought to what is the treatment happening, then that is where the problem gets stuck. So they all have these leach pits which are provided, which has got filled up in some six months' time. So what do you do with the waste that is accumulated in it? So that is the next challenge. So we are actually trying to solve the problem, but you are creating a whole lot of new challenges uh, in, uh, in another way, actually. So just keeping that in mind. So what, how DWOT started is that uh, there were quite a few of us, about seven or eight of us in different parts of India who were all working in decentralized sanitation and water and related issues in our own ways. And this was, if you know, it was like the pre-internet and pre-Google uh, times actually. So the only way that we were probably keeping communication was through either journals or uh, books or like personal contacts and all that. Uh, but uh, finally that happened actually. So. Uh, it was at that time that this whole concept of whether it is possible to do a decentralized wastewater treatment system actually began probably to roots in India. And uh, the initial systems that we were talking about were things like uh, aquatic weeds, lagooning and all that, like using duckweed for wastewater treatment and small, small experiments like that. There were biogas plants and all of those. But the, the whole uh, experiment actually started uh, getting a little more thrust in early 90s when there is this uh, architect called Ludwig Sasse who was based out of Germany who has been working for a who worked in for many years in China on biogas plants and then he moved to India also he actually uh, taking off from his research in uh, in biogas plants he came to the very strong conclusion that actually for tropical climates like India anaerobic uh, treatment systems are much more relevant I'm sure all of you know the difference between aerobic and anaerobic treatment and all that, not going into it. But that was one major uh, kind of a an inter, uh, 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 kind of a research that paved the way for the next whole set of work that happened actually. So he wrote this book which was published in 1998, which was initially called the Loam Watts, but later on the publications are called D-Watts actually. It's a publication by CDD. I think uh, any of you can actually order the book. But it's like, uh, I find that still probably the easiest kind of a handbook to understand all the aspects of decentralized wastewater treatment systems. So with that, I think the whole work that we were all doing in different parts kind of became a little more kind of streamlined. And then under BORDAS, initially BORDAS stands for Premium Overseas Research and Development 
agency which was the Germany based group who actually brought together, brought Nampik Sase and brought all of us together and then we registered as a society in, in 2001. Today CDD has over 20 uh, individuals and institutional members and we uh, work in different parts of the country and we have kind of spread our work even to different uh, other parts of the world and it has offices, we right now have a small office in Cochin, there is an office in Nagpur, Chennai and Jaipur and as NC said since uh, I mean, inspiration, the small firm that I am part of has actually been one of the founding members of CDD and uh, ours is a practice which actually focuses, I, I think many of you might have heard of the name Laurie Baker who is kind of this legendary architect who kind of inspired all of us when we were in college on trying to really be responsible in our profession actually. So our journey into the whole thing of water and wastewater and all that was like a, a continuum of the architecture that we practice which is trying to be more responsible and sustainable and eco-friendly and all that. So today the main, uh, the works that CDD does focuses on actually implementing de decentralized wastewater systems. We have also taken it to the next level of trying to address a fecal sludge which I said a little earlier if you have decentralized system then fecal sludge management is also a very important part of it. Then this whole thing of capacity building is also being addressed too and we also now have started looking into the whole issue of uh, urban wastewater rejuvenation which I'll come to when I talk about LFP. So this is just to say we're not here working so just getting into it. So just to kind of say just to recap, like what exactly, why do we really need a de uh, decentralized approach to wastewater? We all know that uh, centralized, the conventional thing that we all learn in college and we are all kind of used to seeing and all of our decision makers are also used to is the centralized uh, sewerage networks and centralized sewage treatment plants. Now why are these often impractical for a country like India? We all know. One is that of course you need to lay these very extensive large sewer pipes which I think uh, many of you might be in North India where probably the water table is not a big issue but if you are talking about places like Kerala, I mean coastal Kerala and all that when you actually go down to about 2 feet, that is 60 centimeter, you are already hitting the ground water and then imagine laying pipes uh, in one in hundred slope because that's what you need if you want to transport your solids and liquids uh, in through the water and uh, then you can never take it by gravity. I was just telling NC today that even if you're having a pump chamber uh, at every kilometer it means that you have to go 10 meters down to actually get your collection. Then you need a minimum pumping volume. It's, it's really not workable actually. Otherwise we'll have to have pumping stations at every 200, 300 meters and who's going to kind of manage all these things? Where is the power supply going to come to kind of continuously run and operate these pumps? So this is where we, and so invariably for all these kind of centralized systems, more than 50 or 60 percent of the cost goes into this whole laying the sewers and the OPEX is also extremely high. So and the other thing is about getting land which again is a huge challenge particularly for places like Kerala because where land is really kind of expensive so how do you actually get the land to kind of set up a centralized sewage treatment plant and then is it really the uh, people have started protesting also because you don't want the city's whole wastewater to be dumped into a village area and they may not really want it and you're not actually balancing the nutrient cycle also you're kind of taking all the nutrients from a big city area and kind of dumping it into one area which kind of imbalances both the places. So due to all these various reasons, um, so again, yeah, this is what I said. So, uh, so all these impractical, impracticalities is probably why these kind of systems have not been probably set up in many of, particularly the smaller towns and uh, and all that, where it's uh, where people, where the civic administration doesn't even have money to set up such as such a thing, let alone think of operating and maintaining it for next year. And the other major uh, disadvantage about centralized system is that uh, there is no flexibility in terms of uh, how the city grows actually because there is always a limit to kind of uh, the planners to decide which part of the city is kind of going to grow or not. So even in many of the bigger cities where you have switch uh, networks, it is often found that where the lines are laid, probably the development is not happening, where the development is happening, probably it's probably very difficult to kind of connect it to the existing lines and all that. So there are a lot of grey spots or uh, areas which never get connected. So that is why I think over the last 25-30 years, particularly with the research of Rubik Sase and many others in the field of anaerobic uh, treatment, there has been a lot of uh, research happening on decentralized wastewater treatment systems and decentralized therefore means more focused on anaerobic systems. Uh, so the advantage of course are that you can decentralize it to even single household levels. You can still treat it to CPCB discharge standards. 
they are often operable with minimum uh, or semi-skilled or unskilled labor, uh, hardly any mechanical parts, and comparable capital costs, but the operation costs are very, very low. So those are probably the winning aspects. So this is again just kind of uh, saying the same things. Uh, so, what exactly is DWOT? So, DWOT is not really like one technology that you can take across the board and apply it in every scale. We call it as rather an approach actually. So, it's basically the philosophy of trying to understand how you can actually treat wastewater uh, on the site or as close to the place of generation uh, through biological uh, passive means and the treatment process is a combination predominantly of anaerobic but there is also some bit of aerobic uh, treatment of course happening and some bit of anoxic also which happens. So uh, totally the, the whole concept of DWATS is actually we would like to call it as a DWATS approach. Uh, so as I said again that you can start from as minimum as a single household, uh, then you can combine a cluster of 10 or 15 houses and have a cluster level system so you can have like a simplified sewer system and have it uh, for a cluster level. So basically we always try and say that uh, more than taking about uh, one MLD or so it no longer becomes like a, a DWOT system. So we always try and break it into smaller systems so that they are each they are smaller modular systems which can be managed easily. Um, and DWATs uh, can actually treat domestic and industrial sources to a certain extent. Not all kinds of industrial waters, I think, uh, have been, uh, it's possible to do through purely DWAT systems, I don't, but a great degree of uh, uh, small industries which are predominantly can be reduced to biological systems can be tackled. Uh, as I said, very low, simple uh, OPEX, uh, all these things, and they can treat from. 1 to 2,500 cube per day. There is a lot of tolerance to inflow fluctuation is something that we have realized uh, through years of working. And uh, and there is a high degree of customization that is possible that I said and it's modular. All these things have been repeated. Yeah, so the applications range from housing, houses to housing colonies, apartments, hotels, schools, uh, offices and campuses. So it's kind of trying to see the city as smaller units. You don't really have to take all the water to one place but whether you can actually treat the wastewater as much as possible at the source. So it can be for any of these applications is uh, what is it? So what are the basic principles of uh, uh, DWATs? So again as we know the, the fundamental need for any wastewater treatment system the first step is actually sedimentation because you need your uh, when you have your ship and the water everything coming together you your first module is often a settling. So basically the the different steps in DWATs, uh, one is of course the sedimentation and then you have the anaerobic decomposition. That is the second part of it. Uh, I'll just come to each of these modules actually. So these are the basic uh, modules of DWATs. So I'll just start with each of these. So basically uh, the first treatment module in DWATs uh, is something that you are familiar with uh, which we all generally call as a septic tank or it can be called as a settler. So what exactly happens here is uh, which is something that I think in India almost every house or every building mandatorily has a has like a septic tank, doesn't it? So, uh, so what happens in a in a septic tank or a settler essentially is that you have your solids, liquids, everything coming together, and uh, you uh, you separate out the the settleable solids, and there is also you can you you normally a settler has about at least two chambers. Sometimes you give three chambers also. So what happens is that your bigger solids actually settle in the first chamber and the connection between the first and the the first and the second chamber is somewhere in the middle so that you have the floating matter is also arrested, your sludge is also settled and then you have the more of the suspended solids and bit of a sludge going into your next chamber. So essentially uh, a settler or a septic tank actually probably treats uh, gives you a treatment efficiency of only about 25 to 30 uh, percent because essentially what is happening is only a high degree of uh, settling that is happening and uh, 
there will be some amount of anaerobic reaction happening in this first chamber because the sludge there is already over time it becomes active anaerobic uh, sludge. So there is some degree of anaerobics, but basically uh, uh, the treatment efficiency of a separate or septic tank is considered as 25 to maximum about 40 percent, and you normally design the separate or septic tank for a period of about one to three years uh, desludging time. So no, uh, I don't know about. Um, Generally in Kerala and all that, uh, or in many of the South Indian places, at least we know that we give a septic tank that is followed by a soap pit. So what actually happens is that after the septic tank, uh, you actually let it percolate into the ground. Now this is okay as long as your water table is very low and your density of development is very uh, very low also. So you, as, and if you have a good piped water supply, because what happens is that then you are actually relying on the soil bacteria to actually do the rest of the treatment from this 25 to whatever is happening. But when it comes to a case of very high density development combined with high water table and the lack of piped water supply, what is happening is that this 25-30% treated water is directly going and contaminating your ground water or your surface water or your uh, and along with your soil also. So that is why you can never consider that unless it's like a very sparsely located place where you have just like one house and maybe some 50 meters later you have something some other house and your soil is very good maybe the system might still work but it doesn't work in most of our urban context at least so a biogas plant is also like a settler itself it also somewhat does the same has a little better efficiency but of course biogas plants are a little more complicated to build so they are not as popular as uh, the normal septic tanks because you have to make it really airtight and, uh, and all that and there is often a reluctance in people to kind of use the biogas generated from night soil uh, or you have to kind of have a com com combination of using your food waste also to feed it to it. It can work but it needs a little more acceptance from people if you are, needs much more skilled labor to actually build a properly designed biogas plant but effectively that also does the same, the same 30% efficiency. So what we have added as a next module in the DWOT system is something that we call as an anaerobic baffled reactor. It sounds quite complicated, but essentially it's a tank uh, which has at least four chambers. So what happens is that, as we all know, uh, your sludge that is there in an anaerobic condition, which is completely sealed and all that, the sludge inside uh, naturally develops anaerobic bacteria in about 90 days time you started developing the anaerobic bacteria into it. So what we do in the anaerobic baffle reactor is that you are forcing your fresh waste water to flow downward, get maximum contact with the activated sludge in the bottom, then it goes to the, then it up, comes up again and then it flows to the next chamber. So in this process, so you actually, I'll show you towards the end that uh, DWATS has proper design spreadsheets that have been developed to actually work out the the dimensioning and the um, the size, the depth, everything of each of these uh, systems actually. So a properly designed baffle reactor, we design the upflow velocity and we design the area of contact and all properly that uh, with by the time it flows through each of these four to six chambers, we can actually achieve an efficiency of almost 75 to 85 percent just by anaerobic uh, processes alone. So this this gives a massive advantage in terms of the treatment efficiency actually. So uh, basically it's an upflow number of chambers where you give active contact with the activated sludge in the bottom. So in as you realize, as it comes to the uh, the last chambers, your sludge also comes starts coming down because a lot of the sludge is already eaten up by the fresh waste water that is coming in charge of it. So that is the anaerobic baffle reactor and we again design the baffle reactor to have a desludging period of about 2-3 to three years or something like that uh, depending on the space available and all the conditions and all that. More than that, what happens is that the sludge starts getting thicker and when, when the sludge start gets very thick, it's very difficult to kind of desludge it. So we would normally restrict it to about 3 years or something like that. And then the last, I mean, uh, in the, often in the last chambers of the baffle reactor, we also add graded filter media, uh, which we call it as an anaerobic filter. So what exactly is happening here is that the almost 75% treated wastewater, we try to give them a little more surface area for the bacteria to actually work. So 
uh, these are like again upflow chambers, but you have like a perforated slab here, uh, and you again do that upflow so that. And this is a filter media. We normally use cinder or something like that, which has has a lot of pores in it. So there is you're creating maximum surface area for the aerobic bacteria to work. So the last chamber of the last one or two chambers of the tank is normally treated as an aerobic uh, filter, which will give you an efficiency of up to 90% actually. So this whole uh, system, these are all completely anaerobic processes. So you just need properly designed civil constructed tanks. There are no mechanical moving parts or anything like that. Just that it must be designed properly and all that. And after that, so what comes, so uh, you know that if you are looking at normal domestic wastewater, your BOD is generally assumed up to somewhere in the range of 300 to 350 milligram per liter is the uh, normal BOD that we have. You understand all these basics, no? Uh, BOD and COD and all that. I hope that you are all familiar. So, you are talking about uh, an inlet BOD of about 300 to 350 milligram per liter. By the time you finish your settler, your baffled reactor and your aerobic filter, you can get an outlet BOD of to the tune of about 50 to 70 milligram per liter range, you can achieve it. Uh, by normal discharge, Indian discharge standards, with this alone, you can let off the treated water safely into the ground. That is permitted by Pollution Control Board now. So with just a completely anaerobic system, you can achieve it to the level that you can actually let it percolate if you have the soil condition that your water, when your soil can actually let it uh, absorb that water safely. Uh, otherwise, if you want to kind of take it to the next level of treatment that you would like to reuse it for, let's say, gardening or any other non-portable uses, we added a module which we call as a planted gravel filter, uh, or they are also generally called as constructed wetlands also. So what happens in this uh, module is that you know the general marsh areas, you, know, you find these semi-aquatic plants, uh, which you find in many of these marsh areas, what they actually do is that they are absorbing the nutrients from the uh, water and uh, treating it in a way. So what we are trying to do in a planted gravel filter is to kind of create that kind of an environment that you actually make use of the, uh, most of these semi-aquatic plants, they let out oxygen through their root system. So we go for shallow root systems which let out oxygen through it and you give that final aerobic uh, treatment to this water that has come out of the anaerobic filter. So, the planted gravel filter is basically like an open shallow tank which has about 50 to 60 uh, centimeters of graded filter media that is filled into it and we grow a lot of the semi-aquatic plants like uh, kana or typha or reeds and all that depending on what local plants are available which are shallow rooted and which are kind of semi-aquatic any of those plants can be used and uh, once it flows through this and comes out, you can easily get a BOD of less than 30 milligram per liter. And more so, uh, after the anaerobic process, the water will still tend to have a slightly blackish color because it has gone through all the anaerobic process. But finally, with the last treatment of a planted gravel filter, you can get the water as really kind of clear. Uh, and it's, it doesn't have any odor or anything like that, you can safely kind of reuse it. And the planted gravel filter also has the additional function that it helps in pathogen removal. Uh, that is also another activity that happens in the planted gravel filter. So therefore, the, uh, with the final treatment, you can achieve an efficiency of about 95%. So with, for all normal uses, like even for reusing up to gardening or safely discharging into a water body, this much of treatment modules are uh, sufficient actually and you can see that this whole systems are completely passive there is nothing that uh, uh, that needs a kind of very skilled operation or anything like that uh, whatever maintenance uh, that comes into it i just show it to you before i get into the maintenance part of it there is another module the only thing is that a planted gravel filter as you know all the other tanks you can do it below your ground and you can make use of the space above that for some activity. Very often where you get stuck with trying to do wastewater treatment systems is that where is the space for it because everyone will be thinking about this only after they finish the whole building and some pollution control board is kind of knocking on their doses when they think about the wastewater treatment system. So all these anaerobic processes can be in subsurface tanks or you can at least use a space above for something else. But the planted gravel filter does <coughs> need to be in the open. You can treat it as part of your garden as some of the case studies I will show you in my next presentation you can see. 
But if you repeat, it's open space. But sometimes you have situations when you are not even having that much of space available due to various reasons. There is another model which has been developed, which is called a vortex. Actually, vortex, as the name says, it actually works on the same principle of the of the vortex. So you are actually forcing the wastewater to um, create that. Uh, the vortex effect so that there is maximum aeration, there is maximum air contact that is happening for the water and with the vortex you can actually uh, bring down again the, uh, the treatment as much or even more than the planted travel filter. Only thing is that the vortex needs power so and it needs certain amount of maintenance. So if you are actually working on a situation where little bit of power usage is okay and you have some kind of personnel to kind of run and operate the system, a vortex can be a substitute for your planted gravel filter. So, so this is what the, uh, an overall a DWOT system will look like. You have the settler, you have the baffled reactor, you have the aerobic filter, you have the planted gravel filter and finally you can either take it to a pond or something like that and uh, use that water from there for your gardening and all that it can be part of your landscape feature. And that kind of a last polishing pond also helps in the final pathogen removal also because you are exposing the water to sunlight. Or you can have the same anaerobic process of cellular baffle reactor filter and you can have a vortex and then reuse it. So this is the basic processes that is involved in the, in the DWOT system. This is how a, a vortex looks like. These are some demonstration modules which were developed just to kind of see how that actually vortex works and the kind of treatment efficiency that you can see is happening. Um, this is one project where actually you have the whole of the anaerobic systems uh, below the ground that's been landscaped over and you just have this vortex and a small collection pond. Uh, so the only thing that you actually get to see is this. Um, and just to show that you can actually integrate all these things as part of your landscape so that it can all look nice and uh, uh, be part of your overall features of it. This is just a graph which just again summarizing the treatment efficiency. As I said, uh, the septic tank, this is the kind of, uh, uh, if you are talking about an inlet BOD of about 330 or something, then out of the septic tank you might get this much of an efficiency. Uh, your baffled reactor will give you this much of efficiency. The, uh, the planted gravel filter, you can get out a BOD, as I said, of less than 20. And if you have a polishing pond or uh, a kind of a final collection tank, which can also give you a further aeration and, and all that, so you can achieve it to less than uh, almost like 10 milligram per BOD. So this, and uh, uh, so you can see the steep curves in the whole of anaerobic processes actually. So what are the kind of uh, maintenance that one would need to kind of uh, do for an anaerobic uh, treatment process? So the first thing is, uh, I think I put the slides the other way around. Uh, the basic day-to-day -day maintenance of course is that whenever you have a, any kind of a treatment system, you have the first set of manholes from which you are taking your water into it. Uh, you will definitely have to see to it that bigger solids like sanitary napkins or diapers and things like that, no treatment system can actually take care of it. So you do need to have that initial screens, uh, particularly in large use areas, if you're talking about hotels and uh, hospitals or campuses and all that, that kind of an initial screening and, uh, and almost uh, at least two or three times a week maintenance of the initial uh, bar screens or uh, manholes uh, collection chambers will be something that people will have to do. Uh, then the other thing is in the anaerobic, the, in the anaerobic process that is the only thing, the inlet chambers, I mean the initial manholes have to be taken care of and then you will just have to do the desludging depending on your design period, it can be lay once in one year or two years or three years, you will have to kind of define a protocol for it and you will have to desludge those chambers. Desludging we all know right now the desludging pumps and conveyance are available. I think you are going to have another session on fecal sludge treatment and management and all that so I am not going into the details of it. Then in terms of your uh, planted gravel filter and all that, the regular maintenance would be one is that you have to ensure that the 
the flow in and out of the plant in Dravan filter is maintained. So mainly because you have the plant roots which are growing. So depending on your uh, how much of treatment efficiency the plant in Dravan filter has, you will have to trim your plants at least once in a month uh, so that you have fresh plants growing. And at least once in say three months or something, you will have to remove at least one third of the plants uh, so that you are creating a little more space for the uh, for the new plants to grow up and uh, improve it. Otherwise, after a while, the bigger plants with their roots will spread too much and uh, it can lead to clogging. And uh, we have, from our experience, actually only once in about eight to ten years, you may sometimes have to completely remove and clean and backwash and put back the filter, but that will be like a one once in eight years or something like that, that you may have to do it for an aerobic filter also. But other than that, the daily maintenance of these things. So these are all like uh, the regular maintenance are things that a gardener or an unskilled person can actually take care of. Yeah, this is and uh, just last couple of slides. So we, the next step that we are trying to work on uh, is on moving towards prefabrication of uh, DWATS modules because as I said, for designing the DWATS systems, you do need certain amount of skills uh, on understanding the whole, uh, the design parameters, the complications and all that. So now CDDs are actually moving towards prefabricating all these treatment modules so that depending on your, uh, the how much of volume to be treated, you can actually go for a modular system. So there will be like 1 mq, 2 mq, and 5 mq, and 10 mq, something like that. So depending on the treatment volume, you can lay the system in series or in or in parallel and take it forward. And uh, that probably means a little more uh, uh, efficiency and quality also. And as I said, when you are talking about this whole uh, decentralized wastewater management systems, the centralized city level fecal sludge treatment plant is a must. So while we actually try and push on getting people, getting civic administrations to move for decentralized waste management, it's also very important that we simultaneously lobby with the civic administrations to set up city level fecal sludge management units because whatever said and done, you will have to desludge these units once in a year or two and all that. So if you're taking a whole town, you can actually develop a protocol that each of these certain streets will be desludged every week or something like that. So that, and all those things can go to a, a centralized fecal sludge management. This fecal sludge management again can be treated with the DWOT system itself, similarly, uh, similar to the process that I explained earlier. Only thing is that uh, the sludge volume will be more, so we normally dewater the sludge and uh, tr let the sludge dry and we use the water is treated and reused uh, for gardening or whatever. So this is the image of a uh, fecal sludge management unit, the first fecal sludge treatment unit that uh, CDD has set up in Devanagar Linear Bangalore. So these are the kind of design spreadsheets, I don't know how clear they are from there. Um, but uh, essentially kind of trying to tell you that the main things that we need to look at besides the quantity of flow, the COD, BOD, there are also things like the um, your actual physical design parameters, like how much depth can you go, how much with, uh, land that you have and all that, the temperature factors, the 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 conductivity of uh, the, the filter media in each of these things, the organic load with that you go into it. So based on all these things is how you actually design a DWOT system. So this is the last slide of the presentation. Just kind of trying to say that the how we see DWOTs is that it actually is more effective in kind of closing the loop uh, as you know, because you're closing the loop as close to the place of generation as it is possible, as much as possible because that means that you are actually making it much more sustainable uh, in terms of returning back the nutrients to the to the ground, uh, returning back the water to where recharging the ground water and all that. So that whole process is much, much more effective in a decentralized approach than when you are compared to a centralized system.